All right, welcome to episode 71 of the At Bed Podcast presented by War Media, where we give you our thoughts on the latest Chicago baseball news as well as take a trip around the league. I am Saul Rodriguez. Today I am joined by my co-host Gabe Wilkins, who you have seen on War Media's Open Run. He also has his own podcast now, The State of Gabe, with it available exclusively on Spotify. How are we doing, Gabe? I'm doing excellent, so man, it's always a pleasure to be talking about baseball, especially this time of year where you know the action's heating up in October, and seems like we got two good series of brewing right now. You know, you think that they may be done because the team draws, you know, the first two games, it's a two-zero deficit. You thinking it's a sweep, and then all of a sudden, you got one series tied up two all, best of three nine, and then the other series still up for grabs between the Phillies and the D-backs. So I'm excited to see what both um, happen to bring us over the coming several days. Yeah, and, and like we always say, man, best time of the year right now because you got so many sports going on all at the same time. You feel like there's something every day. Like if there isn't a baseball playoff game, there's, you know, Thursday night football. There's all this. I mean, Chicago with Connor Bedard, there's hockey. So it's exciting times everywhere, and that's the best part about sports, especially right now that, you know, that the thing, the season, never. you know, with people that are watching that strictly only watch shows and movies, when you're done with that, you know, you're you're left, uh, you know, looking where to go next. And for sports, right. you're like, you're waiting for the next season, man. So yep, never ends. It, yeah, it never ends. <laughs> and, and it almost it's you can almost say the same thing with uh, even teams that aren't in the playoffs. Because I mean, we always have something to talk about, whether it be the Cubs and the White Sox. Um, and this week, of course, they announced uh, the Gold Glove nominations. So uh, the White Sox uh, have Luis Robert and the Cubs have Swanson, uh, Danby Swanson, Nico Horner um, and Ian Happ. Uh, this is, of course, uh, Ian Happ has been nominated before. He's won before. Nico Horner's been nominated. So is uh, Swanson has won one. So it's cool to see that. And Luis Robert, of course, has been nominated before. He's he won in I believe he won in. Uh, am I correct in saying he won in twenty twenty? Yes, he did. He yes, won he did. his rookie yeah. season. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty cool to see uh, Chicago being you know uh, uh, showcased like that with the defensive side of things. But what do you think about not only that, we'll, we'll talk, you can uh, say what you want with the Cubs guys, because obviously with the Cubs guys, like, you know, we already, you know, we hear so much about Swanson, his defense. Like, I literally feel like every time he's on the national telecast, like Nico Horner, we know he's about, he's 1 1. But Luis Robert, I feel like, man, and we've said it here before, you, we, me and you know better than anybody, his defense is not talked about enough. I feel like, like, his, he's obviously his bat is the best part of him, in my opinion. Like, he's just awesome, but his defense is also you could argue just as good. So how do you feel about him being recognized again and him being able to have a chance now to win one? Cause he has a really good chance of winning this year. Well, I think Luis Robert Jr. has earned it. Mm -hmm. As we, we know in Chicago, he is one of the best center fielders in the American league, but over the last couple of years, following his gold glove in 2020, he's been in and out of the lineup due to health issues and the like this year, we got a chance to see Luis Robert Jr fully healthy, playing in over 125 games. Even though he fell short, I think, about eight or ten games of his goal, he wanted mm -hmm. to play at least in 150 games this season. I believe he played between the ballpark of around like 140 to 142 games this season. But nevertheless, you saw what he could bring to the table on both sides of the field with his bat, and most importantly in this case, with his glove. And he's one of the top three center fielders in the American league when it came to outs above average in 2023 with uh, alongside of Kevin Kiermaier and Julio Rodriguez, who he'll be competing against to vie for a shot at earning his second gold glove in the last four seasons, which would be an impressive feat for him and should go to show not only White Sox fans, but fans across the country, just how impactful and special of a player that La Pantera can be when he's, you know, fully healthy and has a chance to rock out and play every single day because we know what he can do and we know what he brings to the table. And I think as the years go along, if he continues to stay healthy, it'll be many more Gold Glove nominations and hopefully more Gold Glove awards to come and potentially Silver Sluggers as well, which I wouldn't be shocked if he's nominated for once they reveal the list for those. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, man. I mean, the guy's definitely in the running for that as well. Um, and that, and, and you know, what's crazy to me is that. Kiermaier changes uniforms and he's, you know, does it doesn't matter. He's nominated again in there and he finished with the same um, outs above average as, as Luis Robert. It's crazy to me just because like this dude does it year in, year out. Like, obviously we all know that 
offensively, he leaves a lot to be desired, but when it comes to the defensive side, he makes up for it. But yeah, it's cool to see when it comes to, to Luis Robert. I mean, I always love seeing any Chicago, uh, you know, baseball player get recognized like this. And I think that, like I said, he, he needs to be recognized more for his defense. And damn, I mean, honestly, it's scary to think that he can only get like, he can still get better from now here and, and, and still, um, you know, get up to the ranks of being nominated every year and maybe even winning every year. So, I mean, we, we've noticed and we've talked about again on this show, the fact that, you know, Mike Trout in the last few years hasn't been the same defensive player, hence him not being nominated. I know he's injured from a lot of the year, but even when he is healthy, he has regressed defensively. So, you know, that that mantle is is up for the taking at this point when it comes to, to gold glovers in center field. So uh, Luis Roberts definitely a poise to do that. So um, on the National League side, you know, with the Cubs, um, it was, you know, I expected for me, honestly, Swanson and Horner were the ones that were like a lock. Um, to be honest, a little surprised Ian Happ was in there. I feel like he didn't have as good of a year as he had last year when he won one. Um Honestly, looking at the outs above uh, outs above average for outfielders, he doesn't seem to rank too high in that list because I, d- I don't really see him on there. But yeah, I mean, it's at the end of the day, yeah, yeah, he he actually he actually had negative outs above average for outfielders in the play mm-hmm. in, or in the in the uh, regular season for for the for all of Major League Baseball. So yeah, that's surprising, but. At the same time, it's also one of those things. I'm sure they t- they take you know fielding per the fielding percentage, you know the classic uh of uh, uh, fielding stats. Um, but you know what? In 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 a year where the Cubs you know weren't able to make the postseason, I'll take uh uh a false nomination if that's the case here. <laughs> so I'll I'll take it regardless. But I know Ian Happ is one of those guys that he takes great routes to the ball. Um, I think you know he makes great decisions. I mean, I was there. And I saw it in person. Um, against Boston, even though the Cubs got wrecked in that game, nine nothing, um, or it was nine nothing actually at one point, I should say, but um, I believe the final score was like eleven two. But I was there to see it in person. We were in the outfield, and Ian Happ uh, threw out. I, I don't remember who it was that was running the home plate, but he threw him out. And to see that in person, just to see his arm and see his accuracy, um, that 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 just says it all on what he can do with his arm. So it's it's cool to have these guys nominated. So hopefully they're able to win it. Um, and of course, you know, I'm looking forward to see which uh, Chicago athletes get nominated for the um, Silver Slugger. I mean, Luis Roberts a lock, in my opinion. So we'll see where that goes. Um, another thing that's uh, when it comes to baseball news outside of the postseason was Kim Ang, man. I mean, she's out in Miami uh, and that caused a big stir earlier this week uh, because of the fact of, of why she left. Because, you know, it was very abrupt. I mean, like the news hit. I I swear to God, I had to read that thing like three times because I was <laughs> like, wait a second. Is this like like now? Did this happen right now or when did this happen? Right. Because it seemed kind of like, you know, it, it might have happened a few days before that that article came out. But really. um, uh, So what happened was apparently they tried to hire someone above her. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I don't know if exactly if it was like a new position that they were trying to like install in there. President were, of baseball ops. Yeah. So they were trying to hire somebody uh, without her, without uh, her knowing at first, I guess. And then she found out. And when she found out, she was like, basically like, I'm out. Um, and I mean, that's like, there's no other way to put it, but that's fucked up. <laughs> so there's really, there's really no other way to put it. There's really no other, like, it's just, it just is. I mean, that's when I found, when I saw that article and I saw what happened and all that stuff, I mean, it, it, it's just everything that is wrong with the Miami Marlins um, that was wrong with the Florida Marlins uh, is I guess it's still there because they have made so many mistakes over the years, whether it comes with their own players, uh, whether it comes with, I mean, who knows exactly what happened with Derek Jeter. Maybe it was him. Maybe it was organization. I tend to lean organization because of something like this. Um, but man, I mean, it's tough. And I, I will say this uh, it's probably for the better for Kim. Ang. I mean, she's going to get an opportunity somewhere else and she's probably going to have, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's probably going to work out better for her in another organization. That's really what I'm trying to say. And I think uh, it's better for her that she left Miami, but what were your thoughts immediately when this happened? Um, and what are your thoughts on the future of Kim? Ang? I was surprised to a certain degree, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I was not. Mm-hmm. Let's backtrack for a minute. A couple years ago, Kim Ning was bought in by who? A man that you just bought up, Derek Jeter, mm-hmm. who the two of them have history dating back to their time together working beside one another when she was with the New York Yankees after she left the White Sox following the 1996 season. Had some success there and then parlayed that into going to the Dodgers and the rest is history. But Kim and Ng was brought in by 
Jeter. And she did some great things in regards to making trades, you know, from the Jesus Lazardo deal, acquiring Jake Berger and whatnot. The farm system, I think, was in a good place and was in well positioned to have at least a competitive roster within the next several years. And that was a byproduct of the team losing and whatnot, having so many high draft picks. But I think this all came down to, at the end of the day, an issue about who's in charge. If Kim, I can understand why Kim Ng feels a certain way when she led this ball club back to the playoffs for the first time in over 20 years in a full season because we know what happened in 2020. But this was the first time Miami had made it to the playoffs in a full season in two decades. And she was really one of the lead architects of the team. She was helping to bring or try and attract free agents such as Jorge Soler to Miami. And she did a good job in doing that. And then the hiring of Skip Schumacher, his manager and whatnot. But my, my overall thoughts is, is that she must be seeking a bigger position. And mm -hmm. I could understand why she left Miami because, in my opinion, I feel as though Kim Ning feel, felt as though she was slighted. Like, I mm -hmm. built this thing up, and you want to hire someone to reign over me when I've gotten rid of all of the scouts and members of your front office who weren't really contributing any positive to our organization and, in turn, was in the process of trying to help make it better. So while we never got a chance to see Kim Ng fill, out, fill it out, that's okay because one thing about it, her and her husband own a winery in Oregon. Life is good. Like, you know, she, 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 she can sit out for you if she wants. She can also serve as a senior advisor to, to a, a general manager or president of baseball ops. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of shocked, but I'm not. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I can understand why she wanted to leave. My question, though, now is, is, what do you really want? Do you want to be the president of baseball operations or do you want to be in like a lead seat where you're one of the higher ups in the club or just serving as a senior advisor for a year until you find the right job? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And I think it, that's a, that's a good point too, that she has definitely enough time and, and she could even take a year off. That's true. Um, plenty of opportunities that are open and, and, and it always continue to be every off season, man. There's always some kind of reshuffling with some organization um, that would happen. And, and honestly, uh, I, I saw some people talk about how maybe she would, if, is there a chance that, you know, she joins the white Sox? you know, like that, that's something that, that might, that might be in play. Who knows? And nothing, nothing very concrete has come out, but how, how do you feel about maybe her, her coming to the white Sox? And that says, because I mean, I feel like, uh, I mean, she's shown success in an organization like that with the Marlins. And then we, like, as you said, with the Solaire deal, with deals like that, that she made uh, throughout the uh, trade deadline with Josh Bell and all that. Well, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? What do you, how do you feel if the White Sox were able to, you know, uh, you know, sign her and, and, and put her in the front office? If it happened, I wouldn't be surprised because mm. like I told you before, Saul, on, on mm. many episodes here at the Ed Bed podcast, I, I had the privilege of knowing Kim Ng when I was a young child, and she was a vital force in that front office. And at one point in time, it worked her way up from being in, like, player personnel to within the, the general manager seat, like, as an assistant. And was, you know, one of the first women, I believe, to have, like, a salary arbitration case in Major League Baseball. me my only question would be is what exactly would her role be because when Chris Getz was hired as the general manager of the Chicago White Sox to serve in I believe it's the senior vice president of baseball operations seat he basically took Rick Hahn's title Kenny Williams title on the other hand is still open which I believe was executive vice president of baseball operations now, you say you want a single decision maker, and you say Getz is your single decision maker. If you bring Kim Ng in, I'm not pushing back against it, but I think you leave a lot of White Sox fans with the question of who's really running the ship. Is it Kim Ng? 
or is it Chris Gates? Now, if I see if, if Kim Ng comes back, me personally, I believe she'd be coming back in a senior advisory role to Chris Gates. And I think from a PR standpoint, that might work for a fan base that understandably so to some degree is very impatient and wants to see a winner built here immediately after waiting through several years of a rebuild that only netted a division title and a couple playoff appearances with only two postseason wins to boot for it. Yeah, and, and also it, what comes into play as well is, as you say, she might be looking for a bigger, like, you know, a, a bigger role in an organization that she might not find with the White Sox. Obviously, you know, with, with Chris Getz at that position um, and all that. So, yeah, she might be looking somewhere else. And, you know, there's, plenty, like I said, plenty of opportunities. So hopefully she finds something this offseason. If not, uh, regardless, hopefully it works out. But uh, speaking of, uh, of of women in Major League Baseball, man, they obviously another thing, too, that they uh, that came out this week was the Giants, that they interviewed the first uh, a woman uh, for a ma- MLB manager position, which is Alyssa Nakin. So that's awesome. That's another uh, piece of uh, baseball history that was made this week. So um, hopefully she gets a fair shot there and, you know, and, and get and you know, we'll see what happens there because the Giants are in for a big year, no matter who the manager is next year. Ooh, I mean, it could, they could have Otani on the team. They could have, I don't know what, you know, they could, anything can happen next year, but they're really eyeing next year as, as a key, you know, as a key uh, stepping stone to, to, um you know, get back to the, you know, world series contention and all that. So, uh, like I said, hopefully that works out for her and the Giants uh, overall in general. But uh, I'll use that to as a segue for the postseason because, as you mentioned, Gabe, you know, crazy time of year, awesome time of year. And these series that, honestly, we not necessarily thought would be over by now, but when it comes to, you know, record-wise or the way things are going on, on the NLCS side, I, I was surprised the Diamondbacks won uh, that third game, but we'll talk about that. And, you know, that series – it has surprised me, especially after those first two games in Philly on the ALCS side. It's basically going as as we kind of wished for. Um, honestly, when it was two nothing, I was like, man, this might be quicker than I thought. Like it might be over quicker than I thought. But no, Astros said, hell no. They want to put the, they want to give us popcorn and you know want to put us in our seats and uh, for a long series. And I'm happy for that. So uh, we'll talk about that one last. But we'll start with the NLCS, as I said. I honestly thought when it, when it was two zip as well, like I was like, this one, this one should be over soon. And I'm not saying it won't be because it could easily end for one, but I will also give credit where credit is due. The Diamondbacks played Diamondbacks baseball in game three to come out and win that game. And I know, and I, I probably know better than anybody right now at this point, because I saw seven of those uh, wins against the Cubs in September. And this, that win uh, in game three was just about like, 80% of those games, like they just pitched well, their bullpen was great and they had clutch hits and they got those hits when they needed them the most. But regardless, in the first two games, the, the Phillies came out mashing, man. I mean, game one, five, three, uh, game two, 10, nothing. But I felt like those two first games in Philly, like they were just getting home run after home run in the first inning, like Castellano, Schwarber, Harper, whoever it was, uh, were coming out swinging and the atmosphere was playing up, playing a part. And that's also one of the things that like, even if this game goes or even if the series goes a little longer and the Diamondbacks are able to find another win, I just don't see Arizona winning in Philadelphia. Um, they're just so dominant there. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, credit to Arizona for finding a win and, and being able to uh, get back in the series. But what are your overall thoughts in the series, man? I mean, this is uh, obviously not a couple of teams that we didn't expect necessarily to meet each other. Like I said before, this is the first time they face each other in a post in postseason history. Um, so what have you thought about uh, uh, about the Diamondbacks and Phillies? Well, even though it's a 2-1 series through the first three games, I feel like Philadelphia has dominated it for the most part. They've yeah. been in every game. And it's no need to hold your head down after losing game mm-hmm. three in the fashion that you did because it was a very tight ball game. And it was, it was the first game actually in the series where the Phillies didn't pounce on Arizona early and right away. And I think that made a big difference for a young Diamondback squad who – got impressive pitching performances from their starter, Brandon Fott, as well as, you know, their bullpen and Sal Frank and Thompson and Grinko and Seawall. So anytime you can hold the Philadelphia Phillies offense in check, I don't care if you're playing in Citizens Bank Park or at Chase Field like they're playing in downtown Phoenix, you're going to take that and you're going to more than likely have a chance to win the ball game more often than not. But the man that really deserves a lot of credit in regards to Arizona 
finding a way to pull that game out yesterday is Cattell Marte. Mm-hmm. Cattell Marte, I believe, is like 5'4'11 thus far in the series. And you take him off the team, I don't know how they're generating the majority of their offense right now because through the first three games, Arizona as a team has not really been too great at the plate. And I think that's been the biggest difference in the series. However, after winning yesterday, with a pivotal game four on the horizon this evening as we record this podcast, if Arizona can win that, it's a best of three series and anything can happen. And with a pivotal game five and a tie series being in your ballpark, you never know. Because all you got to do is just take care of the crib. And, and you go to Philadelphia and you put yourself in a position to where all you got to do is just take one game. That's it. But – like I said, the series has been largely dominated by Philadelphia. I thought that coming into this series that the Phillies would win this series in six games, and that still could be a a, a big a possibility for them. And I think as long as their offense continues to get guys in scoring position and Bryce Harper and Schwarber and Castellanos and them boys continue to hit with runners in scoring position and make big plays with the bat, it's not going to be too much Arizona can do. No, yeah, you're right. And and with with uh as you mentioned with uh Ketel Marte, I mean the dude is breaking and he's he's always breaking the playoffs apparently because I mean you look at his career numbers, you know, he's got an 1108 postseason uh OPS and this year he's at a 1046 OPS in the mm-hmm. postseason. And yeah, he's really the only one that's been raking um in this series because they've been able to control uh Corbin Carroll, Gabriel Moreno, but also, man, Gabriel Moreno is still taking a beating back there, so that's might be that might be also playing a, a little bit of why he's not being been able to hit um, in the NFCS Absolutely. a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, we, yeah, when you're facing this lineup with Schwarber, um, Harper, Trey Turner, I mean, these dudes, they're they've been there, done that in the postseason, and they're just so seasoned. I mean, Kyle Schwarber's got 200 at bats career in the postseason with 18 home runs. Um, I mean, it's just damn near a 900 OPS. So it's guys like that, that, you know, really, you know, even if they're not having great postseason, because Schwarber, to be honest, this year is not having, like, he's having a seven, he has 796 OPS. So respect, he's, he's having a solid uh, postseason, but not as great as we've seen him say with the Cubs or say, you know, other postseasons that he's had, but he's got three home runs to show for it. So um, yeah. And also another thing too, is that the Phillies pitching obviously came to play as well in the first two games. I mean, Zach Wheeler is, you know, like they've, uh, I've heard this already. They've been calling him a, starting to become a postseason legend. I mean, they're, they're talking about Aaron Nola as well. Uh, him and, and Zach Wheeler just dominated those first two games. Um, and Ranger Suarez pitched a great game too. It's just, you know, uh, he was out, out basically outpitched by fought. And that's one of the things I want to talk about in, in, in the game three is that it didn't come back to bite Arizona. But what did you think about, and this is something that I feel like, Every postseason, there's something that happens like this, and probably this probably won't be the last one. But particularly with the Diamondbacks here, you know, fought was pitching, uh, shutout was pitching shutout baseball, and he they said I think before the game, I think they might have talked about it. He was going to make 18, or he was going to record 18 outs, um, and I believe he did. But he was taken out early, earlier than people thought. Diamondbacks fans were were booing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he I think he had like 70 pitches, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I guess it's just one of those things where it's just you know. Um, the the scripting they do with the analytics and stuff like that uh came into play maybe the third time around. But what were your thoughts when that happened? Um, and and uh, like I said, uh, the Diamondbacks of course don't have to. Answer. or up a run and you know he was in a jam or something like that so it, it in that case they dodged a bullet you know it mm-hmm. wasn't like the situation when you had Jose Barrios in Minneapolis getting pulled for Kikuchi so I, I I didn't make too much of that I think Ranger Suarez has been phenomenal for a game three starter and you you will take the outings that he's given you he's put you in a position to win ball games I mean, yesterday was just one of those old school games, man, where it was a scoreless game for the majority of the of the of the contest. Phillies had a chance a couple of times with runners in scoring position to extend their lead after drawing first blood. They didn't do it. And when Arizona had their opportunity 
in the, in the bottom of the ninth with Craig Kimbrell let some men on base via the walk and whatnot. Cattell Marte took advantage. And I, I want to say something about Cattell Marte real quick. I, I give that guy a lot of credit because this is a dude who was an all-star in his career, has gone through a lot of injuries. And this year, for the first time in the last few seasons, he's been very healthy. And I always was a believer in Cattell Marte, and I thought that if he was ever in the right situation, he would shine on stages like these. And I'm so glad to see that he is because he's always been a big-time player. He just hasn't always been able to stay healthy. But this year, he's been fully healthy, and he's reaping the benefits and the blessings of it. So kudos to him. Yeah, and and still being 30 as well, still has plenty of time. And I know the Diamondbacks sound to a big deal. So, I mean, look, I mean, look, the way he's been playing has been great. Um, and he's really, really been the leader there. Because I know Corbin Carroll, of course, is still a rookie, um, still a long way to go. And, and I, I don't really put a lot on him for, you know, obviously he's having a, a cold NLCS, but he's ha he had a great postseason up to uh, up to up to this point. So and he can still get hot. He can still get hot. And who knows what happens because he's a great hitter. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, like we said before, I mean, I, I was hoping this one like would go to six games. And, and, you know, five, six games, and it and obviously it looks like it's heading that way, so that's good because, of course, you know, more baseball is a win for everybody. Um, and, you know, as much as uh, seeing guy, you know, th there's been a lot of blowouts. I mean, that game two was a perfect example. I was like, man, 10 nothing. Um, you know, that is that how this series is going to go? And the Diamondbacks said no. So, um, you know, that, that's good, and hopefully this series goes a little longer because, you know, the, the way that uh, Tori Lovello manages those guys and the way they respect him, you could just tell in those post-game conferences, the way they talk about him and the way this team kind of rallies around him. And even guys like Evan Longoria, like they have great leaders. So there's a reason why they're here as well. So that, that's another thing too, that, you know, they beat the Dodgers. And I think a lot of teams like, regardless of, you know, oh the Dodgers choke in October, blah, 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 this, like at the end of the day, you got to go out there and play those games and win them. And they 100%. did that. So that, so, and you know, a lot of people may argue, hey, like on paper, like, you know, heading into October, Dodgers were better than the Phillies. So they, they were out there and they, they've been able to beat them. But we've seen uh, who the Phillies are and we've seen what they can do. So that's one of those things where um, I won't be surprised if it ends in five. won't be surprised if it ends in seven at this point now. Like Dimebacks got me fully convinced, you know, that they could string some wins together because, I mean, Gallon can go out there again and dominate again. You know what I'm saying? Like he can go out there and, and bounce back. I mean, guys like that. Um, they're, they're, they're veterans and they're able to, to put stuff together. Right. And one thing about baseball. So every mm. day and every game is different. Yes, sir. You know, you, you, like you say, you bring up game two, they got knocked out by 10, but mm -hmm. you get on a plane, get a, 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 a hangover day, you know, a day mm -hmm. off rather. And you, you, you go to your, your own ballpark. It's a new game. Zero, zero, you know, new ball rolled out on the mound and everything. So every, every day is different, you know, and, and, as far as I'm concerned, until the final out is recorded in the series, you always have a chance. Yeah, of course. And you kind of look ahead now, you know, now uh, game four and game fives. Of course, we're recording this on a Friday, so they'll be playing game four and game five of the NLCS and ALCS. Looking ahead for the Diamondbacks and the Phillies. I mean, they got, uh, I believe it's, yeah, Christian San uh, Christopher, yeah, Christopher Sanchez that will be making, it's got to be, yeah, it's got to be his first, yeah, it's first career postseason start. Um, I, it might be at this point, I'm not fully privy to, uh, the Diamondback strategies. Maybe it's an opener in that case, who knows? Um, but, and I know, but I know for a fact that for the Diamondbacks, it is an opener because it's Ma Joel Mantiply that will be starting. So it looks like we might have a good old fashioned, uh, bullpen game, uh, for these two teams. Um, and that might be wild. Um, so, and of course in Arizona where the ball flies, who knows? We might have a big, you know, big day for offense. Got to, um, yeah, got to. Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. got to be the goal for both sides. It's like pretty much whoever whoever strikes first, in, in my opinion, in, in this game has the upper hand. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. you you, you want to get into that bullpen. Whoever's mm -hmm. the first to get into that bullpen, it's on. Yeah, that's the thing too is that the, so the Philly, the Phillies execute and they've executed plenty of times with that bullpen, even though it does it's not star studded. But we obviously saw Craig Kimbrell. We saw him, you know, shades of of you know Craig Kimbrell with the Cubs. Uh, like it, it, it was, it was rough or, or I got or, some or, too, or, or with the White Sox. Yeah. Game two, game we, two we, of the we, 21 ALDS. I remember. There you, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah. So their, their, their bullpen while uh, I'll be a good still has some, some holes in there. So, um, yeah, I could go either anyway. And, and credit to the, the Dimebacks, uh, pitch or, uh, to bullpen as well with Saul Frank and, and all those guys and, 
those get you know they could really throw it and and they have some great bets in there. But I, the one game too that I'm looking forward to is Saturday because that's that's a good old fashioned ace off uh, with Wheeler and Gallon. Um, so hope, I, I'm hoping Gallon can bounce back because you know he th- he didn't throw a lot of mistakes, but it's one of those things where whatever mistake he threw, they took advantage of in the first inning. So hopefully he's able to bounce back because it's a guy that's not only a Cy Young candidate, but he's one of the best pitchers in baseball. So and uh, and Wheeler, by the way, I was looking at his uh, postseason numbers. Um, and his strikeout to walk ratio in in the twenty twenty three in the twenty twenty three postseason is twenty six right now. Uh, so <laughs> this guy's yeah, I can believe it. yeah, it's, so it's, a, it's automatic W when he's up there. You don't bet yeah, against yeah. Zach Wheeler this year in the playoffs, man. Let exactly. alone the last couple years. It, Wheeler and Aaron Nola have been money, yep. and everybody love to talk about how Aaron Nola had an up and down regular season. Mm-hmm. I think he's gonna be cashing all the way out to the bank after this postseason, <laughs> no matter how it ends for Philadelphia. Oh yeah. And it's not even like it's one of those things where he's not even going to get paid necessarily for this year. It's it's the past, what he's done in the postseason, what he's Absolutely. doing right now in the postseason. Like you, he is an ace, and he is a guy you could trust going into a game one of a postseason. Like he's answered that bell plenty of times, no pun intended. So I mean, that dude is 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 ready for it. So I'm happy to see where he goes. Um, so we'll see. But on the ALCS side, man, look, I, I'm happy, and trust me, if you would have told me. Last week, at this point, the series between the uh, Texas Rangers and the Houston Astros was going to be tied 2-2. I'd be like, that makes sense. But the way we got there uh, is definitely not how uh, I expected it to go because uh, Texas came out um, and, you know, one game, one, two to nothing. Uh, one, uh, or sorry, one game, one, two to nothing. Uh, game two, five to four. Um, and then went back to Texas uh, after tech after, or sorry, went back to Houston after Texas won the first two in Houston. And it, it's just been Away team, you know, like the Astros have been playing great away. I mean, Jordan Alvarez even joked around after the game uh, with David Ortiz saying that he was joking around with his teammates saying he wants them to wear the gray, the gray jerseys at home uh, so they could play a little better. Um, but, <laughs> man, and, and, and let's – it's not even like – Jordan Alvarez, of course, he's always raking, right? But, dude, Jose Abreu, man, your, your boy Jose Abreu, I mean, he is – one of those guys in this team in this lineup that's putting this team on his back and just launching bomb after bomb in October. And there's a, he's a big, big reason why the Astros are back in the series, right? hundred percent. You know, even though I shed a sports tear sometime looking at it as a White Sox fan, I'm happy <laughs> for Jose Abreu. It, it's, it's, it's a mixture of emotions because he deserves this opportunity. He deserves this moment and he's grinded for it, man. And I've always felt like he's a player that's been, ready for the big stage from the moment he came up to the South side, won rookie of the year, you know, won an MVP six years later after winning rookie of the year was the first MVP in White Sox history since Frank Thomas in 94 to do it. So he he's just balling, man. And, and, and what I, what's impressed me the most is he stayed cool, calm and collected, even in spite of his early season struggles. This man, I believe has hit four home runs in the playoffs through eight games this postseason. And that says a lot for a guy who I believe didn't hit his first home run this season to like 50 games in, mm-hmm. you know, and, and he's finding it, man. And I, I, I that, that's that's why it, it, he, he can pretty much have a, a cigar after some of these games be like, hey, that's why they bought me here. <laughs> and, and, and I know he faced a lot of heat from the Houston media. Dusty Baker did as well. Like, why are you playing them and whatnot, you know? But ever since he's came off the IL around late August, early September, the man has been playing his ass off and, and hitting at the plate like the Jose Abreu of old, which is what you love to see, especially this time of year. And the Astros have needed him to be the pedo of old and some. And then you talk about your Don Alvarez. I don't care if it's a lefty. I don't care if it's a righty up there on the mound. The man finds a way to make you work at the plate. He's for a guy that's a power hitter. He's one of the more disciplined hitters in the business. And we always talk about, you know, the Ronald Acuna's, the Mookie Betts to the world. And I understand, but Jordan Alvarez is not getting enough love. And I've, I've been saying this the last few seasons to me, man, he he's the best left handed power hitter I've seen in the postseason since David Ortiz. And he continues to elevate his game each and every single year. And it just speaks to what Dusty Baker has been able to do in the Houston Astros. And I'm not surprised that he got the two, 
to the way that it did. Because if you look at the regular season, Houston, unlike previous Houston teams of the past, struggled at home. And they were 20 games over 500 on the road. And they've had great success this season at, at Globe Life Field. So I, I'm not shocked. I think they're going to continue the success. And with Verlander coming up in a winner-take-all game five with the money on the line, they're going to have every shot to do it. And they could have easily won game one if not for, you know, being unable to execute with runners in scoring position. So it's been a hell of a series. We've gotten everything in some with it, and it's living up to the hype. Oh, yeah. And, and, and that's one of those things, too, where um... – the Astros, you know, it's crazy to see their home and away records, right? Because you're not, it's, you're not used to seeing something like this when it comes to a playoff team, especially a team that won the division. But I think we kind of saw that this season wasn't perfect for the Astros. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing, we're seeing why. Uh, but I think they, they, they honestly thrive on that, right? They thrive on uh, stuff not working out and them having to bounce back because they did that in the series. I mean, you could argue this series is kind of a culmination of of what the, their whole season has been, right? What coming, you know, coming back from from behind and having a chip on your shoulder, they've done it. Even though they won two World Series in the last like five years, I mean, it's just it doesn't matter. So the Astros at home were thirty nine and forty two, and away they were fifty one and thirty. So they yep. were just about they were they finished with the second best record in baseball away from from uh, from their own home stadium. Uh, the, the Orioles, I believe, had the best. They were tied with the uh, Braves at fifty two and twenty nine. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it says a lot of them of how they are of how they are as a team and how they are as, as resilient from playing away because it's not easy, especially in Texas where that stadium is loud, um, just as Houston is. But that stadium, I mean, that that Texas Ranger stadium is just gigantic and just you know has a dome, you know. And so we've seen plenty of postseason games that get loud, even if it's not Texas playing there. So um, and when it comes to you know Jose Abreu, I mean, dude, I mean this guy. And, and we talked about him in, in that series against the Twins and how he he's had a great uh, career against the Twins. So that was not surprising. But him launching home runs in the ALCS gets a little more serious because he's doing it against the Texas Rangers. And, you know, these are guys that, you know, this pitching staff for the Rangers has been one of the, you know, has been probably their best part of, of – or the best part of their team in the postseason, which is surprising, right? Because all year long we talked about their offense – um, we talked about Corey Seager. We talked about Marcus Simeon. All these guys in their offense, Jonah Heim, um, that were coming through. And 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 not not to say they're not hitting right now. You know, Evan Carter's still doing his thing. But like as, as a whole, this pitching staff has been one of the main reasons why they're in the ALCS to begin with. And we saw that with Montgomery. You know, we just we just saw you know guy a, a guy like uh, Heaney struggle though. That's what happened in 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 the last in in the, uh, you know these last two games. Is guys like that struggle so. Is it one of those things where do you see the the Rangers pitching staff holding up? Because look, at the end of the day, Max Scherzer uh, coming in after not pitching a month, a, a guy his age. Not saying not saying before the game, I wasn't saying he didn't have it in him because I, I believe he did. But it's just looking like it's a little risky to put a guy like that out there at this time of year when you have certain guys certain guys you're, you're gonna have to face like these Astros. It's no game, you know, like you can't mess around with those guys whatsoever. Um, do you think the Rangers pitching staff still has what it takes though to bounce back in the series and and lead these guys to the World Series? I believe we're about to find out, so mm -hmm. I, I truly believe we're about to find out. This is the first time that the Rangers have been tested in these playoffs. We got to think, man, that this was a team that had won seven games in a row going into game three. And then you put Max Scherzer in as your game three starter, like you said, after sitting for over a month and a half. And it's a big difference between a bullpen session versus being thrown fresh into the frying pan. You know, when you was inactive for the last month due to having to recover from your injury and all of that. So we're going to see, because over the last two games, Houston has got into that bullpen. Something that Baltimore didn't do and Tampa Bay sure as hell didn't do. So now they're getting tested. You saw Bradford out there, the lefty reliever, on back-to-back -back nights, game three and game four. You know, like, when, you're, when your starters aren't able to go at least six strong and give up no more than 
three earned runs, like giving you quality starts, like it's they they gonna tap into your bullpen. So Jordan Montgomery, in my opinion, this is the biggest game of the playoffs for the Rangers because it's your last home game that you have in this series. You you have to win it. You 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 have to. If you don't, to try and take two on a row in Houston, where you know that crowd is gonna be into it, it's tough. But that was always my question about the Rangers, and I think you know that as well as I do. And everyone's question was, could the bullpen hold up? We're about to find out now because when you lose back to back games at home the way that they have, man, you, hey, you 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 got to come with it. Yeah, no, and you're, and you're right because it's one of those things where going into the series, we talked about going into the postseason in general, um, the their Achilles heel was the bullpen, right? And we're, you know, a game like yesterday is a game you don't want to see when your Achilles heel is. But Laoti Tavares saved the day in center. I didn't understand that. As much as I hate to question Bruce Bochy, who's a Hall of Fame manager, when it's all said and done, Jordan Alvarez, you can't really play matchups with him at this point. It don't matter. Sometimes you just got to let dudes finish their inning. And if Dane Dunning has been a guy that you can trust and is a spot start in his reliever, I I'm curious if he's in that situation again. How does he play that? Yeah, that, that's true, and and we've known uh, Bruce Bochy to be a you know a great manager with his bullpen, a great Absolutely. manager overall. So yeah, it's another it's another test, and especially I mean, look, and, and and baseball is way different from what it was. Even you can make an argument when it comes to bullpen, when it comes to uh, decisions, when it comes to analytics. Since like you know his days with the rank with the sorry with the Giants, so it, it's cool to see a manager like him. Uh, having to deal with these situations because you know that, you know, he's got different things, uh, you know, in, in store. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, th th it'll be interesting, but yeah, looking ahead, as you mentioned, this game uh, number five with uh, this pitching matchup with Verlander Montgomery, I mean, Verlander's going to have to pull it out, even though, we, you know, we've seen him do it many times, but really, as you mentioned, Montgomery, for sure, it's going to be his best or sorry, his biggest game 
um, of his postseason career because, I mean, he's he's done it so far in October, right? He's pitched great. But, I mean, every mo- every moment, every start gets bigger and bigger. So it's like, how much can you, you know, take? And um, they've seen him already once. Not only that, but they've seen him multiple times in the regular season. So let's see exactly. what the Astros, how the Astros reply because – um, I could easily see them winning t- winning tonight and uh, taking this, um, you know, to to seven game series soon enough. So that'll be interesting. But these series, man, they, I, honestly, at this point where we're at right now, they've probably honestly d- delivered for for as much as we can expect. I mean, the, like I said, the Diamondbacks, uh, hopefully they're able to win another game to even sh- keep stretching it out. Don't take it. I I, I don't def- definitely don't take them lightly. So it's going to be really cool to see where these series go in a week from now. A week from now, we'll have our World Series matchups. Uh, so um, it'll be really fascinating to see which two teams, um, g- uh, you know, go out there and, and win their series and are in the fall classic. So uh, I think it's a good place to wrap things up for this edition of the At Bat Podcast presented by War Media. I want to thank Gabe Wilkins for joining me here on episode 71. Uh, of course, you can catch him on his own podcast, The State of Gabe, like I said, exclusively on Spotify, uh, where he's talking all things football, basketball. Uh, so definitely check him out. And of course, check out all our other war media shows, the bears, Den, all our collaborations with sports zone Chicago as well. So check that out uh, for Saul Rodriguez. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the at bad podcast and enjoy your weekend. Thank you everybody.